What's up, everybody? So I went live last week on Monday, and I told everybody I was going to come back and be live again next week, Monday. So I got to hold myself accountable, and I showed up tonight. Hopefully, some of you guys join me and come back. Um, but even if not, I'm not going to make this long, so I'm sure you guys can catch it later be, But uh, if you didn't make it live. But I did want to jump on and talk about um, like financial steps that you take in different decades of your life, like when you're your teenager, when you're in your 20s, when you're in your 30s, and really kind of talk about what my experience has been and then just, you know, answer questions, see how you guys are doing, all that good stuff. So I'll start by, um, hey, what's up, you guys? Ah, you guys jump in like super early. What's up, everybody? I, um, I guess I'll start with my teens. In my teens, I didn't really do anything with money. I, I had a job early. Like I started working when I was like, 14, 15, yeah, 15, I think. It was my sophomore year and I got an internship at the high school that I went to. It was like an art high school. So you had to pick a major, um, you know, art, like painting or art, visual art, um, dancing, singing, acting, or instrumental music, or uh, like, uh, what do you call it? I forget what you call it, but where they do like um, stage design and stuff and like the tech, I think it was called tech. But anyway, those were the majors and I was an art major. So I did all like, the, you know, art painting, drawing, sculptures. And I got an internship at a, at a museum or no, my first job was an internship at an architecture studio in the Lower East Side of Manhattan. So I would leave school, hop on the subway, go downtown and then just go there for a few hours after school, most days a week. And they would pay me, they paid me like pretty good at that time. And I don't remember because it was like 2005, 2005, 2006 and 2007. But the point is, I was making money. I would get my paycheck like every two weeks. Every time I got my check, I would straight up just go spend it on food. Food was the number one reason why I didn't have any money. And it's crazy because I feel like that has not changed. Like a lot of times I go into classrooms and I'll talk to the students virtually. I've been doing a lot of virtual classroom visits and the students will tell me I, I waste my money on food. They like, that's where the money goes. And that has not changed. You know, I used to go to the Chinese food spot and buy, um, French fries with hot sauce and ketchup, <laughs> chicken wings. I would go and buy, um, I would buy dumplings because I was in the Lower East Side. So um, there's Chinatown is really close and there's a lot of really good authentic Chinese food there. I would always buy dumplings there. I could get four for a dollar back in the day. I don't know if they still have that now, but my money was pretty much just going to food. And I never saved literally any money at all. So I just wish I had started saving in my teens because now, when I talk to, to students, teenagers, I tell them there's a couple different options that you have for starting to, to save your money and put it away. Like, forget about it. Just let it pretend you just wasted it. You spend it on something and pretend that money doesn't exist if you can. Right. If you, you know, a lot of teenagers have to work to support their families, to help pay bills. Like, I feel you. If that's you. Great. But if you do like do that. Great. Be that person to support your family is what I mean. But um, at the same time, if you do have the opportunity to take you know, $5 a week or $5, even a month, even $5 a month, right? $60 a year is more, is better than nothing. And the point is, it's not about having a lot of money to start. It's about learning. And even if you start with $5 a month, you're going to start learning how it works. And that's the value of getting started early. And of course, when I, when I say get started early, I'm talking about investing, right? You could obviously put money in a savings account, a CD and all that. But investing money is really, um, you know, tricky. And a lot of people don't wait, they wait till they, till they really like, to older, like till they start working. And I really think people need to do it earlier. So what two things that I think you could do um, is one is to start uh, in a custodial investment account. And I feel like, you know, for me, that's something that I never heard of. So like, I understand if you're a teenager and you watch my channel and you're like, what, how am I supposed to know what that is? But um, you know, that's the point. Like the point is to start now learning because you're young. So you have a lot of free time that you're not going to have later when you're in college or when you have your first job, you're not going to have the time, the extra time to, to just read, to watch videos, to listen to podcasts, just to learn. So take advantage of that. One of the things that I would say um, really, really helped me was that I actually started reading books about personal finance right after um, I was trying to figure out like my credit card debt and everything. And that helped me so much. So if you can do that, do it because it's going to make a big difference in your knowledge. And um, there's some really good books out there about money that are not like, you know, too, too, too dry, uh, too technical, too boring. So definitely get started there. And, um, you know, custodial account is great because you, even if you're under 18, you can put the money in the account. Your parents or your guardian has to put the money in the account for you. But then you're good once you turn 18 or stay 20, once you become like you're not a minor anymore, boom, all the money in is yours. So, and, and the custodian who helps you open the account, let's say that's your like your parents or your uncle, your aunt or something, 
they cannot touch the money. <laughs> it has it has to be you. So that's the good thing about a custodial account at a brokerage firm. But if you work like I did when I was in high school and get a paycheck, I would say a, a custodial Roth IRA rather than like a general custodial brokerage account. Because the beautiful thing about the Roth IRA is that if you make if you make contributions, it's money that has already been taxed, right? So you never have to pay taxes again on that money. And it's going to grow. And the interest, the interest, the earnings, the profit that it's going to make in the account, in the investment account, is not going to be taxed either. So the cool thing about doing that when you're a teenager, instead of waiting till you're in your 20s or 30s, is that you don't have to pay taxes on your income if you're a teenager and you make less than the standard deduction. And in 2020, the standard deduction was 12400 I know a lot of teenagers that work and they don't make $1,000 a month. So they could pretty much invest, never pay taxes on their income or their earnings and the profit. That is like wild. Like think about if you could invest right now and never pay taxes on the money, not income taxes or capital gains taxes. That's like unheard of. But for anybody who's earning less than 12400 I think that's from 2020. And then for 2021, it's 12,550. So it went up a little bit, which is good because if you, you know, the, even if you make a little bit higher, um, you can still do it. So I think if you're a teenager and you have the opportunity to go with an adult to open a custodial Roth IRA, woo, do it because it's a, just put dollar, $5, like that money is, you're never going to pay taxes. Taxes are such a big deal. I don't know if a lot of people understand, especially at a young age, how much taxes takes from your what you make um, throughout your life. So if there's any point in time where you could take advantage of not paying them, jump on it because that's amazing. Um, hi, how are you doing? Hey, Kira, how are you? Hi, Jasmine, Patricia, Samantha. Shout out to all the people that came in early. Tyree, Cliff, Elizabeth, um, Mo, I don't want to say your name wrong, Sunem. Sanem, Chrissy, Tamika. Um, what's up, you guys? Um, Samantha said, what is your top three financial books? Oh, for young people or just like in general? It's kind of hard. There's so many good financial books. Like, ah, and I feel like I read so many. Um, okay, top three financial books. For, for just getting started, like, and you're just trying to, like, understand everything. I really, really like um, Get a Financial Life by Beth Cobliner or Cobliner, I don't know if I'm saying her name right, but that was one of the first books I read in my early 20s. And it was a really good, like it, it's a little technical, but it, it just kind of breaks things down pretty simple to all of the things, saving, budgeting, checking accounts, investing credit cards. And it gives a little bit of everything, which is good because it's kind of like a crash course book. Um, when it comes to investing, my favorite investing book is um, J.L. Collins, The Simple Path to Wealth. Because that book, he specifically wrote it for his daughter. As a father, he wrote it for his daughter. He's like, if I could just tell my daughter, teach her everything that I know and help her to become the, like the best, you know, to invest for long term, like in the best way, everything that I've learned to just impart my wisdom on my daughter, I would. And he ended up doing it in a book. So not just his daughter is getting it, but everybody who reads the book. And I, I, I love that idea. And I also just think that book was so, so helpful in me to understand not just how to invest, but understand the investment industry, the sec, like that, like the career of going to be an investment advisor or like um, a mutual fund manager. Like I never knew that what that meant, like, what do they do? And so that book helped me understand like that whole industry and what, how do they make money? Why are they always chasing profits? And how do they do that? How do they chase profits? And how do they generate profit? Right. Um, and so that's why I love that book. And, but it's also just straightforward and easy to read. So Go also do the audiobook. I love audiobooks. And then let me see. I got to think of a third one. Oh, third one. It's hard. Um, I mean, you know, I kind of have a soft spot for Susie Orman, even though she's kind of like, uh, I guess her books are maybe were written a little bit more in a time period that's not super current or relevant because it was before social media. It was before, you know, everything um, technology wise, like apps and stuff. But I still think like she got some of those core principles that helped me get started. So I, I, I just I still think it's valuable. Um, two of her books actually that I read early was uh, the the money book for the young, fabulous and broke. And then women and money, which was the first book about money that I ever read. And I literally picked it up in a pharmacy in, in New York. It was like, um, I don't remember where I was, if it was in Brooklyn or if it was in 
in Queens. I think it was in Brooklyn because I was near my house and I walked into a pharmacy and I picked up a Women and Money by Susie Orman book. It cost me nine dollars and it was the best nine dollars I ever spent because that book taught me so much about like budgeting and paying off my credit card debt and all those basics. All right. I think I got you, Samantha, with those with my three books there. I even gave you four. Uh, Brittany says personal. Oh, I already answered it's hard right now because savings is not giving you much. So it doesn't honestly really matter. All that matters is that you get good customer service. It is FDIC insured and that your interest rate is at least on par with the others that compete with that bank. You know, um, if you have a credit union near you, it's always a great option because it's for the people. It's more community based. Um, but if you're not banking online, you're probably getting the highest rates on savings. So just putting it out there, high yield savings accounts, that's where, you know, higher interest rates are going to be at. So that's where you want to be. Um, okay, let's see. I was listening to your podcast today for the first time and I'm hooked. Yay, how to be safe. Thank you. I love that. You know, the podcast is really fun because it's just a conversation like this. It's just like us talking, right? Like it's just... I mean, you guys are not talking back. It's just me talking to, to the screen. I get to read your chats, and it feels like I'm having a conversation with you guys. Um, but yeah, so if you haven't checked out my podcast, you can find it on any app that you listen to podcasts. It's called Mind Your Money with Miss Be Helpful. And I do try my best to post the videos too here. The videos are so long, like 40 minutes, 35 minutes. It takes a long time to edit. So I'm behind. Like, I think I'm like three three or four episodes behind on YouTube that you can listen to on the podcast, but they're not, the videos are not up yet on my channel, but they will be by January. I'm going to say, so I could stick to it. January 20th, <laughs> by January 20th, I'm going to have all, I'm going to be all caught up. Okay. With the videos. Um, in for, uh, investing is still so foreign to me. I hear you, Andy. It is hard. Um, you know, reach out to me, missbehelpful at gmail.com. And I can send you as many resources as possible. They're free that are educational. My big thing too is like eventually one day I do want to have courses to help people. Like a lot of people ask me, like, do you have a course? And I don't yet. It's just because like you guys think about like all the time that I'm spending. I have a full time job, and then I also do YouTube, and then I also have my Instagram, and then I also have the podcast, and then I also do a lot of volunteering, and then I'm also on the board for a nonprofit, and I also am. I just joined the Financial Wellness Council at um, CNBC, so I got to have hands on things and it takes away time. So Sitting down to like really do a course, not to make excuses, it's something that I just need to do. I need to make the time, but um, it just hasn't happened yet. So hopefully 2021 maybe will be the year for me to do it. But a lot of my time has also been sucked, uh, you know, working on other projects. So we'll see. I I'm going to try. But if not, in the meantime, what I do is if you email me, I must be helpful. And you're like, I don't even know where to start. Investing is like looking at a foreign language. Then I, what I do is I respond and I send you links. Um, you know, free webinars that I have done about investing, anything that I have that I can't share that's free. So you don't have to pay and you can just start learning. Um, and then eventually, you know, if I did have courses, I, I'll also, you know, put that on, on YouTube for you guys as well. Big goal for me in my teens was saving. Yes. Okay. So let's go back to that. Right. So in your teens, your, your thing is, is saving. You should definitely be saving. Right. But also try to think about investing as early as possible. Once you get to your twenties, like you're in college, it's so much harder to find like extra, you know, money. And also if you had been investing since you were young, you, you can lean on that money to pay for school if you need to. And that's, that's a beautiful thing because any little bit helps. Um, the, the one thing that I always do tell people to be mindful of is that if you have your money in a Roth IRA, it is beautiful because it does not affect your FAFSA, your financial applicate, uh, financial aid application, federal application for, for student or free application for federal student aid. If you do FAFSA, if you've done it before, you know what I'm talking about. Anybody that has to fill out FAFSA, they don't have to report money in the Roth IRA because it's technically for retirement. So that's beautiful because then it does not affect your financial need when you apply to college. So anyway, I'm going to be talking about the Roth IRA all day, every day, preaching about the Roth IRA because it's it's amazing. And I wish I had started it when I was a baby. I wish I had started when I was, I mean, you need earned income. So I couldn't start it if I was a baby because you can't earn, I mean, you could, I guess, if you're like a baby gap model or something. But anyway. And that's a trick too. Like I actually hear, I've been reading a lot about parents who, who they, even if their kid is a baby, if they like, say for example, their child is a baby gap model or like a model in general or whatever that earned money that the baby earns, boom, put it in a, in a custodial Roth IRA. Like these are things I wish like generational things that like, I wish I knew that I wish my family knew. And you know, kind of like you can, now I know it's a pass it down, but if you don't know, you don't know. So it's really important to get educated. All right. So 
20s. Talk about 20s. The biggest thing I think in your 20s, I even wrote some notes. Let me get my notes. Savings. It's so hard. So I think before going to savings, you got to start with like just budgeting, right? Like just knowing how much money do you have if you have money coming in and where is it going? And I think most people don't do that in their 20s. We act like we do, but we don't. And so we have to start with just a budgeting plan. Like, where is my money going? And if you don't like doing that, you got to follow people who make it fun. Like Berna. Hey, Berna, she's great at making money fun, making it like a party. You know, she, um, she has a Spotify playlist, money playlist. Like, these are the types of things. Like, you do whatever you got to do to try to make it fun. So it's not so boring. It's not such a chore. You know, like, oh, like, I don't want to do my budget. But if you attach it to fun things, like jumping on a call with a bunch of people and putting on a Spotify playlist and everybody does their budget together, like, those types of things make it easier and more fun. So try to do that, you know, in your 20s and find that community. Like, Instagram, hashtag debt free community, hashtag personal finance. Um, all these things, like it allows you to find other people that also kind of like are have these types of money goals too. So 20s is the time to do that. Obviously, if you have not done a Roth IRA, by the time you're in your 20s, that's a good time to do it because most people in their 20s have some sort of job, right? Yeah, even if it's minimum wage. And then I think it's a really good time to start understanding your credit. You might not get your credit right until like your later 20s, but at least you got to start understanding it because I my big mistake in my 20s was, y'all already know, I was taking my credit cards and swiping them up and down, left and right online shopping, all kinds of things. And it just ruined my, my credit. So I had to start basically repairing and fixing it instead of taking advantage of um, good, you know, offers and deals with a good credit score, which is what you can do right out, right out the gate. If you have a good score, you can get better apartment offers. You can get, um, you know, um, better loan offers. If you want to get a car, you can get a, a better deal for a car loan, auto loan. Like there's so many things. And I just didn't know that like credit mattered that much. And then the other thing I'll say when you get to your, Late 20s, what I started doing was my debt repayment plan. After I was like 24, 25 is when I finally said, all right, you know what? I got to pay these credit cards. And that's when I actually sat down to make a debt repayment plan. And I have an amazing webinar that I did. It's free, but I'm trying not to post it online. So, But I do share it. If you want to get it, just email me. Ask misbehelp at gmail.com. Say, hey, you said you had a debt repayment plan, like how to make your debt repayment plan. Can you send me that webinar? And I will send it to you. But, you know, I just those are a little long, like again, 40 minutes or so. So I don't like posting them, but if you need it, let me know and I'll get it to you. And then the last thing I'll say about twenties is life insurance um, and health insurance. Those are things that most people don't think about until they're older, especially if you have kids in your late twenties or, you know, even a little later, like life insurance is really important because if there's anybody that depends on your income, you, and then you pass, like you're leaving them kind of flat, like with no help. So life insurance is really important to get just the basics and also health insurance. A lot of people don't realize when you are young, you think, oh, I'm covered under my mom and dad's health insurance or whatever. But when you, when you turn 26, you off that. You, you have to figure it out on your own. And unless your job offers you health insurance, which a lot of uh, jobs don't, especially if you work at a small company that they might not have to, or if you work part time or gig jobs, or if you're a freelancer or um, an artist, you know, th they don't they, you don't you want to have that so it's important in your 20s to start learning about the basics what's a premium what's a deductible what's my out-of-pocket expenses what are what's my out-of-pocket maximum like those are things you gotta you have to um know just those basic things all right let me see what you guys are talking about hey boo i see investing latina in here what's up julie um patricia says what are your thoughts on dave ramsey method i i think if it works for you it works for you you know i never tried it myself i just i don't know like when i was in, in credit card debt, I never thought about doing Dave Ramsey's method. I just, the re research that I did showed me that when you look at the credit scoring model, it doesn't make sense to cancel and cut your credit cards because it, unless you have a lot of cash, you're going to need eventually to lean on your credit. If you want to get a house, how, how you, you, you need a house, you need credit score to get a mortgage. And so in my mind, I was like, okay, I, I understand that that works for a lot of people, but it feels very extreme to me. And being a low income first generation child of immigrants, completely ignoring the credit system is probably not going to work for me unless I am ready to stack up so much cash, which I wasn't able to do because I was helping my family and trying to get out of credit card debt. So I think if it's for you, if it works for you, do it. Just do what stick, what, stick to what works for you. And, and if it doesn't work for you, then don't because it's no reason why you should stick to a plan that's not it doesn't feel right for you and it doesn't work for you, you know, but I recognize there's so many people that tell me like, oh, Dave Ramsey changed my life. Okay, great. Good for you, boo. Um, uh, what are your thoughts on Bitcoin? Actually, I just posted this on Instagram. I am pretty optimistic about Bitcoin 
I have I watched the banking on, banking on Bitcoin documentary. If you have not seen that, it's free. You can watch it on Vimeo. Just go type banking on Bitcoin Vimeo. Watching that helped me learn so much about it. Like, because I thought I understood like you know what it was all about. I had read, I had watched videos and stuff like TED Talks, but I didn't know like the genesis, the the creation of Bitcoin and what does it even represent. It's really like it is a disruptor in how people transact outside of money like that's the thing people think about it as just money but bitcoin was created in the blockchain so it uses it relies on the blockchain system which is really the magic that's the secret sauce of what makes bitcoin so revolutionary and so learning about blockchain learning understanding about like what are they trying to do what was the um you know the genesis of it and what is the meaning of it that helped me a lot to really think that that I, I believe that Bitcoin should be successful and will be successful, but I don't know if it will, because again, I, nobody knows the future, you know? So what I've done is after a lot of research, I decided I like it, but I am also not in a position to take such a big risk like that because it could work. It could not work. Who knows? There's not a lot of historical data because Bitcoin is brand new. So what I did was I just calculated my net worth and I said, I'm going to take 1% percent i'm gonna have 99 percent of my money doing tried and true investing and saving and one percent i put in bitcoin so that's my take on it um last week you talked about uh oh i lost the comment last week you talked about your goals for this year are you reading a book right now did you read anything this week yes really bad i did let me show you what i'm reading right now i actually did post about this on instagram as well um I do Audible and I have so many credits because I was backed up for a while. So right now I have a bunch of books in my queue that I'm planning to read and I have four credits left to spend. So again, last time I asked you guys for book recommendations, if you have any new ones, hit me up because I have four credits. But right now I'm reading Who, Not How by Dan Sullivan and Dr. Benjamin Hardy or Ben Hardy. And I like it. It's really for like kind of like business minded people. And I've been doing a lot of reading like that because I feel like I'm not naturally inclined to think business minded like thoughts, but I want to learn more about it. And so in this case, the whole premise of the book is that when you focus on how to do things, you waste a lot of time and you might not be the person that has the right skills to make that thing happen to do that. So stop focusing on how you're going to do something and start thinking about who is the person that can help you get that done. And I love that. I love that so much because I don't ask for help enough. And so it's just kind of making me think like, okay, what am I going to do in 2021 different from how I did in 2020, you know, instead of trying to edit everything myself for YouTube, what if I get somebody to edit for me? What if, you know, like who is going to help me to get, be more efficient rather than how am I going to find the time to edit more videos? How am I going to find like, stop just who, not how. So I like that. That's what I'm reading right now. Co-signing the biggest mistake. Yes. Oh, my Lord. Listen, credit card and co-signing was definitely my biggest mistakes. I agree with that. Um, oh, my gosh. There's so many questions here. They're so great. All right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back to talking about the 30s, and then I'm going to come back and do more questions, and then I'll wrap up. I don't want to be on here too long. But I'm going to talk about the 30s because once I got to my late 20s is when I kind of started getting my money right. I started getting my life together. But I'm turning 32 this year. I just turned 31 in 2020. 2021, I'm turning 32. And what I noticed about my 30s is that I'm getting a lot more mature and I wish I knew these things when I was younger. <laughs> so um, here's the four things that I feel like by the time you get to 30, like you got to kind of just have these four things in place. And the first one is a cash savings plan. Like if you don't have a fat amount of cash stacked up, it's hard to do anything. And even if you have a lot of debt, like forget about the debt. This I'm talking about cash, which is your emergency fund. I did not know the value of an emergency fund like seriously until I experienced a really bad fire. And you guys, if y'all have been following me on YouTube for a while, you saw the fire. The whole thing happened. I posted a video about the fire. I mean, you didn't see the fire burning, but I showed a video of me experiencing that fire. And I wish that I had renter's insurance. And that's one of the big things in my late 20s. I learned about renter's insurance because I didn't even know what it was, you know. And so these are the types of things you have to like. You know, you have to be proactive about learning so that you don't make the, those mistakes where you need it and you don't have it. You know, you need renter's insurance or you need health insurance and you don't have it. So cash savings plan, a.k.a. emergency fund. Um, so make a, a plan to save up cash and enough cash that makes you feel comfortable that you're not stressing out. 
the second thing is a debt repayment plan. If you have debt and you're kind of stressed about it, everybody who has debt is a little stressed about having debt. But the only way you should be stressed is if you don't have a plan. If you have a plan, it helps you breathe a little easier. You don't really feel the stress as much. You're like, okay, well, I have my plan. And, you know, I'm not going to be debt free tomorrow. But like, if I keep sticking to this plan that I already put in place, I know exactly what I need to do. I'm going to become debt free. So it's nice to feel that relief a little like, huh, you know, when you actually have that debt repayment plan in place. Um, and that goes hand in hand with credit because the usually the reason why people have that is because of credit. Uh, it could be because of college, but most of the time it's because they took, you know, credit cards or personal loans or car loan. Um, and so these are the, or maybe even a mortgage, but the point is all of these things have to do with credit. And so it's an important time to really understand credit. How does it work? What is your credit? What can you do to improve your credit? All that. Like, I think that's so super, super important. But to me, it's still, even though credit is so important, it still comes number two after emergencies fund. Like, and I think COVID taught us that like COVID, like whew, 2020 hit people hard. And I am so grateful. Like I have nothing but gratitude for the universe and for all the money gods and goddesses that helped me get my money right before COVID. Because if I had not had my money right during COVID, I would not have been able to help my family members. I would not have been able to help my friends. I would not have been able to, to be secure myself. And yes, of course, I was very fortunate to not lose my job and things like that. But I still feel like it was more than that. It was actually having a lot of cash in the bank that if somebody couldn't make rent or if somebody couldn't get groceries or if somebody couldn't pay the electric bill, like, you know, I, I could help. And that's an amazing feeling to be able to help people. So, you know, get that cash right, get that emergency fund in place and then get that debt plan. And then, of course, number three after that to me is investment plan. By the time you're in your 30s, you, you have to know something about investing. And if you don't, if you're in your 30s and you don't know anything about investing, do not be ashamed. Do not cry over spilled milk. I mean, you're already in your 30s and you still don't know that's what can you do now is basically what you should be asking yourself, right? Don't look at the past, look at the future. What can I learn starting now? What can I put in place? And so, you know, for me, it starts with retirement. That's how it started for me. When I got my first job, I literally cheated off of, I, I told this to, to Julie from Investing Latina. I literally copied off of the teacher that I worked with off of her 403B plan. I copied everything she wrote. So I didn't even understand investing when I started. And I'm not saying that people should not should invest even if they don't understand. I, I think that's not the best way, but it's better than not investing at all, which is, you know, what I'm glad that I didn't do. Like, I'm glad I was 22, 23 investing in a 403B. Even, even if I didn't understand, at least I was putting money in every month before I got my check. And that's a beautiful thing. So um, it starts with retirement. And then eventually, obviously, you could do more general investing. Uh, number four is fund plan, which one plan is not it's not to say that is the last thing that you should do, but it's just one of the four things I think is so important to think about. A lot of times in the personal finance community, people talk about save, invest, budget, this, that, taxes. Oh, insurance. Do you have enough insurance? You got to make your life fun. <laughs> you have to, because if you don't have a fun plan, you are going to be miserable. And I don't want that for you. I don't want that for myself. I don't want that for anybody. So you have to, like, I think for me, fun comes from inside from within me like I get fun from like being alone I get fun from also being, being with people I'm a very extroverted person so I, I I think it comes from inside of you and you have to know what are the things that bring you joy and make you have fun so that comes from like your circle like who is in your inner circle and when I was a teenager my inner circle was just like my friends from school like my friends from the block and you know and that's fine I'm still friends with a lot of them but there's also a lot of them that I'm not friends with anymore because they were not ambitious. They were not, um, you know, they weren't, they didn't have that hustle. They didn't want more. They were just comfortable, like being lazy and just, you know, doing stuff that was just going to get them in trouble. And so I think it's important to, at this point in your life, once you're in your 30s, have a clear picture of the people that you want in your circle. And what are the qualities, the characteristics of those people? Because if you meet people and they don't meet those, those characteristics and those qualities, keep it moving. Like you don't have time to waste. You grown now. You don't have time. Like when you're teens, you're friends with everybody. Oh yeah. Everybody could be in your, you're, you're in the clique. You have friends with it. In your thirties, you don't have time for that. Okay. So I think tightening that circle and having that like knowledge of like, all right, these are the type of people that I roll with. These are people that, you know, that I want to be around. And for me right now, that's people who are ambitious, people that are like hungry to make an impact. Now, I know when I, when I say ambitious, I don't mean people that are just trying to make money. That's not what this is about. I, of course, I value money. I teach money education. But what I'm talking about is 
making an impact in a way that means something to you. I, if I cared about money, I'll just be working on Wall Street. I'll just be, you know how easy it would be for me to get a job in Wall Street? And I'm from New York City. I could easily be like a um, wealth manager. I can just go into you know, a, um, a brokerage and just say like, listen, I know everything. Give me a test. I'll ace it. I can, and then just get, make six figures managing people's wealth. Sure. But is that, to me, is that going to be impactful, like the work that I'm doing now? And so, yes, of course, you have to have a bare minimum in terms of like the money that, that you need. But to me, I, I want to meet people that are, are care about impact the same way that I do. So that's what makes you that's what makes you cool in my book. OK. Yes, Francisco came in here and just dropped a bunch of fire emojis and John dropped a bunch of fire emojis. So clearly I'm spending half. <laughs> All right. So um, let's see. Let's see what questions y'all got. I mean, I kind of said everything from my 30s that I wanted to say. You know, there's, of course, there's like income and um, salary um, goal that I had. I wanted to also net worth. Like I wanted to double my net worth. I wanted to like focus on getting a, a raise and negotiating my salary. Those are all things that I did in my 30s. I was too scared to do it in my 20s. If you could do it in your 20s, do it in your 20s. There's no reason why you should put it off. But I'm just speaking personally from my experience. I did those things a little later because I was little. I was a little scaredy cat in my twenties. Don't be a scaredy cat. Don't be a scaredy cat. Scared money don't make money. Um, investment. Uh, no, no. Oh, and I think the other thing too is goal setting about your lifestyle. Like I feel like now in my thirties, like I figured out what I like. I, I I know the life I want. You know, like when I was twenty, I was like, I don't know what I want. If you, somebody had asked me like, what kind of life you think you're gonna have, I'd be like, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. But now I know. I know that I like my red wine. I know that I like getting a massage every, you know, a few months if I can. I like good food. Food is important to me. Healthy food. Food that is high quality, that's delicious. I like, you know, like very good food is important to me. Um, I don't care about certain things too. Like I don't care about like decor, like style or like, you know, art on the walls and different things in my apartment, the carpet, plush, this, that, like, I don't care about that because I had our apartment fire. And what that taught me was it doesn't matter how decked out and beautiful your apartment is furnished. If it burns up, you're going to lose it all. So I don't really value those things anymore. I also don't value fashion. I'm sorry. Like fashion is just not my thing. If it's your thing, that's great. It's just not my thing. I don't value like, you know, makeup or like um, nails, like doing a lot of like those things. I feel like some people spend a lot of money in those areas that that's just that their thing. Like they're very interested in that. I don't care about that stuff. Um, that doesn't mean anything to me. I don't care about um, like perfumes. I don't care about, um, I don't know, like there's so many things like, oh, like, you know, when you travel, people like obsess like souvenirs. Like every time I take a trip, I got to bring something back from that trip. Nope. You know what I bring back? A lot of pictures, a lot of memories. Okay. And my journal, I write everything that I did so I can remember the trip. It's just, I feel like I've just changed so much in terms of like the things that I valued before and the things that I see other people value so much. Like I just thought I had to value it too. And now I know that I don't have to value anything that I don't want to value. Like you don't have to do something just because everybody else does it. I, it. That really hit me in my late 20s, like 29, 28, 29. You know, now that I'm in my thirties, I'm like, yeah, I like me for me. I know what I like. I know what I don't like. I know what's important to me. I know what isn't. The faster you can get there, and the faster life starts feeling real good. Um, things that I don't care about. Oh my God, so many things. I have a little list here, things that I really don't spend money on because I'm a, a minimalist. I really don't spend money on like a lot of physical things. Um, I like nice clothes, you know, like I do. I will invest in something nice if I know I'm going to wear it for a long time. Um, let me see. Going out like with friends is, is important to me from time to time, but I don't do it the way I used to, like reckless. You know, I used to just go to bottomless brunch all the time. Like, oh, let's go to this concert. Let's go to the movies. Let's go bowling. All, everything was yes, yes, yes. Now I'm very calculated with who, who am I socializing with and, and what are we doing, you know? But I will spend money. I'll spend money on a really good show. Um, like right when COVID hit, man, I was so mad, like so mad because my friends and I, I also bought tickets for the show, but my friends told me about the show. And I was so mad. It was a comedy show that I was supposed to go see. And I was just so, so sad because I didn't get to see it. But, you know, it is what it is. At the end of the day, you kind of, you know, you just, you kind of got to roll with the punches. You know, I didn't get a chance to do it. And that's fine. Um, so other things that I don't care about, I guess, like, alcohol. Like, I used to drink a lot of alcohol. And 
Um, I just don't anymore. I don't know. Like I just wine. If that counts for some people as alcohol, I mean like hard liquor. Like I used to like vodka, rum. I don't know those things that people like mixed drinks. Like if I'm out, I'll buy a mixed drink, but I'm not going to purchase the the hard the liquor in my house. Like spend drop money on bottles. Like I I I'm at the point where I'm like, nah, I just need a glass of wine. What comedy show are you talking about? It was Ali Wong. I really, really wanted to see Ali Wong. It was like, I honestly would have spent hundreds of dollars. I got a really good di uh, deal on the tickets because I got them early. I would have spent hundreds. Ali Wong, if you're out there, if you want to give me a free ticket to the next show because I the one that I bought, it was canceled. Girl, I will appreciate it. <laughs> um, Oh, okay. I like this. Mariah said the best thing I did was uh, make a note and make a list of things that I would not buy and then having an alarm and note. So I see it every morning. Ah, so it's like a very, like every morning, remind yourself of what you value and what you don't. It's like the more you see it, the more you internalize it and really get to be okay with it. I like that. Shirley said, I love Ali Wong. She's amazing. I know, right? That's why I was like, so, see, there's certain things I will drop like two hundred dollars to see Ali Wong. Maybe even three hundred dollars. Don't you look? Don't play with me. I will drop money, but it's because that experience is something a live show, seeing a live performer versus like there's some concerts where you go and you're all the way in the top, all the way in the back. You pay like sixty dollars for your ticket. Like that's not my thing. I don't. I wouldn't do that. I would only go if I could get really good seats, and I would drop some coin on that because of that experience, right? Being intimate up close, or if it's like a live band in a speakeasy or like a cafe, like I would drop, I would drop money for a cover there, but not like a random club with pack a bunch of people and there's a performer. I, in my twenties, I would have done that. Now, not my thing. I don't need random people sweat all over me. I'm good unless I'm working out and dancing at 305 Fitness because that's <laughs> then I will love all the sweat because I love getting my work out there. My husband and I finally started investing. Yay, amazing. We just started Roth IRAs. That's amazing. We only have a thousand each. That's okay. Listen, you can just, you can start with that. I really don't think people have to wait to, uh, to wait till it's fully funded. That's just my thing. Um, I think Debbie asked that. You don't, I don't think you have to wait. If you have even any amount to start, just start. And later, if you hit a goal that you want, you can always transfer it to another brokerage or, or whatever. But at least the, the earlier you start, the better. And the other reason why I'll say the earlier you start, the better is because I was reading about conversions a lot recently because, um, you know, so the, the fire movement, a lot of people told me I retire early, but you can't touch your retirement account until you're 59 and a half. So a lot of that people get confused and like, well, what about, so if you read about conversions, there's rules where you can take money out of your traditional IRA or your, um, your 401k or your 43b and move it to your Roth IRA. Now in that year that you move it, when you file your taxes, you're going to have to pay taxes on that, the amount of money that you moved because it's income that was in a pre-tax account, which means that you paid it, you put it in there before you pay taxes. You can't, you cannot escape paying those taxes. So when you move it to the Roth IRA, you have to pay taxes when you file your taxes next, the next time. But then after that, you wait five years and the money, you can touch it without a penalty. So you can't avoid the taxes, but you could avoid the late, pen the, the early withdrawal penalty of 10%, which I think is great. I never even knew about that. So the, the thing that you have to know is that you the account has to be there for five years or the, the money has to be there for five years. So if you don't have a Roth IRA, um, you know, definitely start now. But if you move the money, then you have to wait the five years, right? One of the things that I didn't realize that now I'm excited about is that if you have a Roth 401k or a Roth 403b and you want to start accessing the money before you turn 59 and a half, you can do a conversion to your Roth IRA or, you know, move the money to your Roth IRA. And if the Roth IRA was already open for five years, when you move the money from a Roth 403B or from a Roth 401k into the Roth IRA, then you don't have to wait five years. And for me, that was just an incentive like, all right, well, then the faster you get the IRA, the more you don't know, you don't have to worry about that five year waiting period. If, if you have a Roth 401k or a Roth 403B from your job. So I just think anytime people say, should I wait? Should I wait? I'm like, why? Like, why, why? What are you waiting for? What are you waiting for? Just if you have money and you sit in the side and you want to invest, start. Just start. The more you wait, the more you're putting it off. Every day, you're not invested. Every day, you are not taking advantage of compounding returns. Like, bro, just get started. I was supposed to see Juan is in April and he canceled. And oh, that's so sad. Listen, I feel you. That's the same thing with the Ali Wan concert, man. Janet Jackson seats were on fire. <laughs> 
Listen, I understand that some people get a lot of joy from jumping up and down in a giant crowd. It's just not my thing, you know? And that's what I think is so important about what I said to figure out what's your fun plan and figure out your values. Like, if you know that that brings you joy, you can put money towards that. For a person like me who knows that that's not for me, like, I now it's just so easy. Because now if somebody invites me to a big concert like that, I'm just like, no. <laughs> like, I, and not to be mean, like, no, I'm not going with you. Just a very easy, concerts are not my thing. So I'm not going to put my money there. It's a very easy, my brain doesn't even have to work. It's like, nope, not doing that. Can we think of something else that would be interesting to both of us? We will both um, enjoy. So, you know, those are the types of things I would say that the earlier you start to learn about yourself, the better. Where Master says, I'm sleeping on the floor to save money and it's worth it. Well, you better get yourself a hammock. Have you not seen my video with my boyfriend? You need to, my boyfriend was on my podcast and we did a video about how, um, you know, our, just all the things about money and him dating me as a YouTuber and everything and himself. And we talked about how we have a hammock and not because of the financial reasons or whatever. We just, we really like it. Like we did it as kind of like just to take naps and have it in the apartment. Like kind of how some people have like a swing. It was supposed to just be fun. And then we just, we stuck with it. Right. And so a hammock probably run you like 150 bucks maybe, whereas a mattress can cost a thousand. So, you know, if you're sleeping on the floor, and you want to try a hammock, I definitely recommend it because it's not super expensive. But um, what they do say, though, is if you have back problems, sleeping on the floor is the best thing for your back. You just sleep flat on the, on the floor, but it's just not very comfortable for a lot of people. So um, there's so many things on here. Oh, my goodness. Do a video on minimalism. I have one, Samantha, but I guess I should do more. I don't really talk about it. It's just to me, it's just like my life. Like, I'm just like, look at my kitchen. I don't even have anything on the counters. Like, I'm just, oh, it's just, <laughs> it's just how I live. So. Yes, I'm a minimalist, but I guess I could do more minimalist stuff, like answer questions, go through stuff. Like, what do I have? What don't I have? That's always helpful for people to see. What's the best place to open a Roth IRA? My favorite place to open any types of investments is Vanguard because they are not for profit. They started in um, the 70s and disrupted the investment industry. They're essentially the first to say, we're not going to be greedy and just take a bunch of fees and profits. We're going to make this community based and member owned and member based. So that um, the fees are not like super high. And basically, um, you know, I, I, I like that. And I respect that idea that you can still live good. You can still make a living and, and make a lot of, of money without having to, you know, take advantage of the fact that people don't know a lot about investing and charge them super high fees, which I think a lot of brokerages have had been doing for so long, still do to this day, because people don't know expense ratios and, and loads and fees. They don't know what that stuff means. So I love Vanguard and I'll probably be investing with Vanguard to the day. Ah, die. Hello from Canada. Hey, Canada. Stay here for like another few minutes. So if you have like a really burning question, drop it at the bottom now. But otherwise, I think, I think there's only like a few questions that I really didn't get to. But these are always fun when they're live because like these live questions from the live chat, they go away after the live chat. Like, you know, it used to be that the... Live questions would stay on the bottom of comments when you post video on YouTube, but that's not the case anymore. Not the case. Um, Monger, can money buy happiness? You know, money cannot buy directly buy happiness, but it can definitely buy you a lifestyle that it makes it a lot easier for you to feel happy more often. And, you know, that, that can really um, change your life. That can really Im impact your lifestyle a lot. I know that um, a lot of the people that I know that are in my life and even people that uh, I maybe are not in my life anymore, but that struggle financially that I've met, a lot of their stress and their sadness and their frustration is directly tied to the fact that they are um, struggling financially. So, you know, I, I don't believe that money can solve every problem and just make you happy. But at the end of the day, a lot of issues that people in low income communities face can be solved if you gave them opportunities to get money more easily, to access money more easily. Raising the minimum wage, allowing people to have a living, uh, a, you know, financial dignity, um, things that just, you know, can impact the average American in a way that like right now, we just accept the status quo. Like who said $7.50 or $15 was, was okay as a minimum wage? Like, you know, and we just accept it because, oh, th that's the rule. But it doesn't really allow you to live with dignity. And that's shameful. We should be doing better for our people. So I don't know. I think money can make you a little happier, man. 
uh, talk about other first gen immigrant finance gurus that you've learned from. I'm still learning. Oh my goodness, first gen finance um, who are immigrant. Well, let's see. Um, the immigrant part is hard, but I know that at least a lot of children of immigrants, like like me, my parents are immigrants. Um, so let me see first gen stuff. Ramit Sethi obviously um, is great. He's probably one of the most well known, um, you know, in the personal finance space. I think uh, the Finance Twins on Instagram and also they have a blog. The Finance Twins are great, amazing content. Awesome, awesome. Um, First Gen Wealth is really great. Um, oh my goodness, there's so many. I, I feel like I would have to like go to my Instagram and look. Wealth Para Todos, I just had her on my podcast today. She's awesome. Um, yeah, I mean, there's a lot. I'll come back to the video and add them. Uh oh. What happened to my internet? Uh oh. Uh oh. My, my internet connection is unstable. Let me see. First gen. Oh, yes. Zay. Follow first gen wealth building on Instagram. He's great. First gen money musings, first gen money, first gen living, first gen professional, first gen rise, the financial talk. There's a lot, man. Anyway, there's so many resources, you guys. I'll, I'll come on here and I'll add more. Do you teach people about how to get a better job? Sure, why not? I mean, you know, I, I think the important thing, Curtis makes a good point. He said, are you telling people to get better jobs? Some people are trying to make it with $10 an hour with kids. I, I understand, I agree. But one of the things that I'll say too is that um, in this capitalist society that we live in, you are paid according like to the skills that you that you use at work and the the problems that you solve you know and if those skills and those problems that you're solving are not what society considers to be um valuable or important then that is what is that's essentially reflected in the lower pay so i think what's important is figuring out a way to either take the skills that you're really good at. And even if they ain't valued by society, there's a niche of people that do value that skill, right? And you can create something for that audience. So at the end of the day, a lot of times I do, um, I think like if a $10 hour, a job, a $10 per hour job is something that you feel like is your only option. What else um, are you really good at that you can monetize? Like, um, not to say that they were struggling financially, but there's a YouTuber and also on Instagram, Belief, Belief in, what is his name? He's amazing. He is, I'll find him right now. Belief Mel, Belief in Fatherhood is his brand. He was, out, he was working, not very happy, uh, quit his job, I think. And while his wife was working, he was a stay-at-home dad. And he couldn't really figure out what in the world was his passion. What did he want to do, right? So he started recording his kids and himself at home. And now he has a hugely successful YouTube channel where he's literally just like a, a YouTube dad. Like, and his kids are adorable. You guys probably recognize the because one of his kids went viral, um, the little girl where he was doing her hair. And she was like, it's like a ball. It's like a ball. He was like, like a bow? And she's like, no, like a ball, like a ball. <laughs> because he was wrapping her hair. That was so cute. Anyway, that is the type of thing where you have to think outside the box and be creative sometimes. Trying to figure out what career fields or what like traditional nine to fives, like if you have the skills to get those types of jobs, you will probably be able to get them with some career coaching, maybe with some resume help, with some interview support, with some communication training, um, problem solving skills, critical thinking, um, writing skills. Those are all things that you could learn and, and then get promoted, right? If you show those skills. But if not, if that's not your thing, and you, you don't really want to put that work in in those areas, be creative about other outlets, like make a course or like, you know, other things like that. All right. So many awesome questions, but I didn't get to a lot of them. And we're already hitting close to 50 minutes. So I am going to wrap this up. Stability creates a path for happiness. I love that quote. Don't touch my hair. That is a beautiful quote right there. Um, hi, Nappy Meal. Oh, my boyfriend's cousin is on. Hi. She says, hi, gorgeous. So sweet. Um, what do you think about M1 or Charles Schwab? Great, great. I think they're both great. Honestly, I think all brokerages that offer low cost mutual funds, index funds, exchange traded funds with um, no load options for trading, like these are the things that matter. Is like, are they allowing you to have a low cost 
access to investing? Do they support you in helping you understand your investment options? If you try to reach out and the people are not helping you or they're confusing you more, keep it pushing to another brokerage. There's so much support in the industry. You just got to find it because there's a lot of people that are not supporting new investors. And so move on and find somewhere where you can get the support that you need to learn. The less I have, the less I have to worry about cleaning. Yes, Mariah. That, uh, do you see that? That is why I'm so, like, I'm so minimal because less cleaning is definitely a benefit from that. Absolutely. All right, you guys. Well, I think I am ready to wrap up. Thank you so much for joining me. I hope this was fun. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think that's, I think that is pretty much it. I, I don't see any other questions that I didn't answer. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for, thanks for the great information. No, thank you. One of the things I'll say too, before I wrap up is if you haven't seen my Instagram, um, highlight, go check it out. I did a Q and a this past weekend and you guys, I put my heart and soul into that Q and a, like I was on there for hours answering all the questions that I got and, you know, making a cue, putting little like emojis, putting little things and there's a lot of valuable content in there. So if you're interested to like do a little bit more deep dive in some of the investing stuff that we talked about, some of the re uh, resources on my Instagram page, just click on the first highlight that says Q&A January. Check it out. All right, everybody. That's all I got. So peace out. So next time, you guys, I think I'm going to come back again next Monday. I'm going to try to do this every Monday because it's just easier for me to come and do this live rather than having to like do edit and post production and all that kind of stuff. It just takes more time. Diane, hey, Diane. My mom be like, how come she don't have nothing in her kitchen? Tell her because she got all this stuff to do with her time, then be cleaning things in the kitchen and putting things where they belong and dusting and wiping. <laughs> Not even a toaster, a blender. Oh, no, no. Okay. I don't use a toaster because I don't eat bread, but I do have a blender. Oh, wait, do I have a blender? Yes, I do. I have a blender. I have a, like, you know, all the smoothies on the go blender. <laughs> you just take it and you make a quick blender and then you, the, the container turns into a cup, like one of those like ninja. It's not ninja. It's like a bootleg version of ninja. But listen, that's all I need, girl. That's all I need. <laughs> yes, that means that every Monday. You know what? I'm going to be back next Monday. I hope you come back next Monday. I'm going to do this live every Monday. Either 6.30 or like 7.15, like around the time after I ate and like you know, finish my work did my reading, that kind of thing. All right, everybody. Thank you for joining me. Peace out. I'll see you guys next week.